everybody, welcome to Leon's Chainsaw Parts and Repair. Looking at a Home Life 450 here. Uh, this one's got a multitude of problems apparently. I haven't test run or attempted to yet. There's no reason to. Uh, the note in the box was, uh, this is a saw that when it gets hot, it starts acting like it's starving for fuel. Which in and of itself, I'm, yeah, I'm not too worried about that. I, I, I'm going to assume that it's a carburation issue. Uh, the saw's been torn down to replace hoses. I can see new oil hoses here, and this is a new fuel hose. In fact, these look like some maybe even I supplied. I can't swear for certain, but uh, uh, anyway, I, I don't believe it's an ignition issue based on that, but the note in the box said that the fuel and the oil are still mixing, and it's been torn apart, and he said a gasket put in there, and I can kind of see that with some sealer, but I need to see what's going on. Uh, that's not the first time that I've come across a saw, one of these 450s or 550s, where the, the seal between the tank leaks. There's an aluminum baffle plate, I believe it's aluminum, that's in here, and it was originally the tanks were sealed. Now, I could just attempt to do this with red coat without taking it apart, but I don't... I don't feel the best about that. I'd rather take a two-prong approach. Get it apart, reseal, clean up all the old garbage, reseal it with a, a sealer that I know for a fact will work, the Permatex Moto Seal. And then, that with it apart, it'll be super easy for me to clean all that and, uh, and get acetone on every surface in there. Get all the old oil, fuel, all of it out. And then we can follow up with a coat of red coat once I've got that sealer in there. So I'm going to go under the naive assumption that because it's been apart once before, that it's going to come apart nice and easily this time. Uh, yes, there was humor in there. I'm seeing a few screws missing, a few improper screws along the way here. Uh, this upper AV mount screw is missing. The upper muffler screw is missing. So I just want to get this thing apart and uh, kind of see what, what it is we're working with. Since I don't get to work on a huge number of these, I thought I'd do a video with some of the teardown. So, I think to make things just a little bit more visible for you guys, we'll use our, our vise here. Yeah, that looks better. And if I have to move some stuff, whoop, move some stuff, uh, the camera closer or something, that'll be easy enough to do. Some spacers here to take up some extra on the threads. That might be enough, I hope. I think so. These saws are not super complicated. And if you follow a disassembly procedure, they come apart relatively easy. There's only one thing that's a giant pain in the butt. And that's actually one of these oil lines. And as I'm talking, I'm trying to remember if this is the biggest pain in the butt one or if the 650, 750 is the biggest pain in the butt. But there's a nylon oil line. These threads are jacked up. Now one will do. It's not like we're test running it right now. Nylon oil line down in here. Yeah. Let's see how all this goes that has some fittings on the end of it that don't fit through the air box. Once you got them crimped on, they are crimped on. That's it. It's over. Okay, that's about as good a view as I'm going to be able to get for you guys. It's not bad. So I've gotten as far as taking off the drive case cover and the air filter cover, which has obviously been repaired. And it's holding. Whatever that epoxy is, it is holding. The air filter sealing surface is undamaged. This is gooey crap is what's left of the old air filter grommet. There was no air filter in here. So we'll have to clean all that up. But for now, let's get this carburetor out of the way. And I'm trying to remember. These are a pain in the neck. So this is a spring-loaded choke rod here. 
and by spring-loaded it's just tension that's holding it in place. Now if I remember right, we can just kind of work it out. Yes, Lily, I am. Okay, there we go. So choke rod is loose. I'm going to retract that a little bit. Maybe get it the hell out of the way. The impulse line comes up from the bottom right here, and that looks original. It is. It still appears to be sealing okay, but the end is kind of oblong. We're going to replace that. Then we'll slide Whoop. the screw loose. This is a difficult air box to work on. Very difficult. I can't see squat down in there. Yeah, that is. Come on. There she goes. Whew. All right, there's a... Oh. All right. Folks, this might be part of the issue right here. See how... What, Lily? I'm just looking. I'm watching. Okay. See how that boot is distorted right there. And the screw was actually pushing it that way which creates a bubble right there this may not have been sealing and when it gets hot it may be enough to create an air leak no way to know at this point but in my world that boot gets replaced yeah I, I had a sneaking suspicion that might be what the heck the problem was here but we'll keep going because we still got to deal with that fuel tank. So we got to get the throttle handle out of the way. You've got your AV mounts up here. You got four screws going into the air box from that direction. And then one back here. Now this saw, you want to be careful. They don't have cast in threads in most places. There's actually nuts that slip into these slots back here. And you want to be sure to capture those as you're taking stuff out because they are not retained in there by anything but grease and oil and sawdust and that is not the best system ever when you start hosing it down they will disappear don't even think about trying to steal my stool, Troy. I am not. Um, maybe I will. I'll just sit on this one. Yeah, we've got a mishmash of sizes here, so... Some of this we'll be able to figure out. Some is just I'm going to go to the hardware bin and replace. Now that oil hose is not Tygon. And that end is pretty, pretty formed, so we'll see. That may get replaced. So again, here's that nylon. This is the pressure line. And it's going to be stuck in the air box. So if we can't get to it back over here to disconnect it, we're going to kind of have to let the air box hang a little bit, which is a little hokey, but it works. And if you follow the sequence on taking these apart, they aren't super bad. So these are the four air box screws. And an important note, I've got it, I didn't show it, but you want to make sure your piston is set so that if you accidentally drop something down in there, the crankcase is not open to where it can jam in place. That's bad news. Nobody wants that. Okay. Those AV mounts are just going to pop out. You're pulling your intake boot loose at the same time. And then you got a fish. Yeah, that oil hose is garbage. That thing is 
as stiff as a board. It's not even going to go through with that bell end. So we will replace it. The fuel hose is still good. The note did indicate that non-F fuel was what was used, which is phenomenal. Yeah, that's the original impulse hose. We're going to replace that. That boot is otherwise in good shape, but it's so distorted up here on the flange that yeah, I don't think I don't think I dare reuse it. Too much work to get it to this point to find out that it's not going to work. So then the tank itself is retained by two screws on this side. And the two AV mount screws on this side. Now one is covered up way down here. And I may have to take this out of the vise to get to it. Shoot, I am. It's sitting right on top of it. Well, that sucks. That is the first time <laughs> that this chainsaw vise has ever gotten in the way of removing something. Not a bad track record. Alright. Slide that back. That's not going to obstruct too much of your guys' view. So there you can see the one AV that's missing. I mean, look how much this is moving around. That's not normal. We're going to inspect everything. Quit trying to get in the video, I'm you torper. Yes, you are. Get our starter out of the way. You can tell this is the original coil. They were blue at first before they went to black. Alright, and now we're going to get well, the throttle handle brace. How do you what? How do you start the thing when they go? Well, I don't start it right now. I'm working on it. Oh, because the thing's off of the... Yeah, the starter's off. Yeah. Okay. Alright, that should be... Should be it. Now, the bucking spike, that's going to get in the way. We're going to get it now. And that's some beefy hardware. I don't think that's original, but it holds it on, so. This is just a busted arm waiting to happen. See, there's one of those lock nuts I'm telling you guys about that has fallen out of one of these holes. one babe this is a lock nut it would be very difficult thank you okay housekeeping here so we can avoid losing the hardware. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. That's it. This tank ought to come out. 
So these AV mounts have been in here for a while. Let's kind of work them. You see this one's coming loose. There it goes. Ah, that one's broken. No, here, don't throw it away yet. That explains part of the wiggling around the saw I was doing, though. Okay. So there's that upper AV mount. Fell right out. That wasn't doing deadly squat. This one's unscrewing, which is amazing. So that's rubber that's vulcanized into the steel insert there, and these can be a real pain in the ass to get out sometimes. That one is still reasonable. I don't know why that upper one is broken. This one's broken. See how it came right out of the steel insert. It will not operate properly that way. In fact, the steel insert's even backed out a little bit here. So we got some work to do on this. A hell of a lot, actually. I'm going to capture some more of these lock nuts before they go crazy. And there's going to be some on the bench, because there's already a few missing here. There's another one. Looks like some of them went missing when it was assembled before, because I see some nylocks that were in place of a few of them, which will work just as well. These slots are designed to be just wide enough to capture it, so it won't spin in a circle. Alright. So there is the next point of disconnect so we can get this throttle handle completely out of the way, which I definitely want to do. Now, do my 5 16 There it is. And then we can actually do this in a logical progression. We can seal that tank. I just get two jars of toothpaste for Mama. Okay, thanks, Katie. And this will all get hosed and cleaned up. I will see if I have a new boot on hand. I might. But I'm going to use one where the flange isn't distorted like this. I'm going to clean everything up. Since I'm already this far into it, I want to pull the muffler and just check for any, any signs of scoring on the piston. To do that, you just remove the snubber, remove these screws, and this is a tight fit. This little aluminum piece always bends a little bit, but once you've got it out of the way, there's a couple Allen head screws in there. Screw here. Are you showing those how and there's supposed to be, I'm doing a video, Katie, so careful with those glass jars. And then there's supposed to be a screw up here, but that one was already missing, so that's going to get added back in. But other than that, these are, I mean, these aren't super complicated. So if you needed to, to split the crankcase, this is like the 330, it's like a 240, a Super 2, where you've got this kind of a clamshell. Crankcase splits right here. You would take your flywheel and coil off. That side would come off, and this would split right apart. We don't need to do that. This is as far as we need to go. I'm going to set this aside. We're almost done with this part. And then there's the up close. You can see all the sealer and I won't swear to it, but I think there might be a gasket on both sides of the aluminum plate. It's a good idea, but those gaskets will wick gas, unfortunately. Uh, and apparently, they're mixing, you know, in the tank somewhere. So I've got to see that baffle plate and see what's what's going on with it. When I reassemble it, it will be just, excuse me, with the baffle plate and the motor seal. And then after that, I think I've talked myself into doing red coat on both sides after that. So I think we'll end the video for now. That's Hi a guys. nice, uh, no, mm -hmm. this is not a kid's video tour. <laughs> this is a nice uh, kind of a teardown on, uh, on a 450 or 550. So we'll, to be continued. Okay, so I've got all the screws out. They weren't super tight. I don't think that was the issue, but I won't swear to that. I mean, with gasket in there, I don't think that was the issue, but uh, they did come out pretty easily. 
anyway, let's split it apart. And you've got, what is that, eight screws. And there's a couple places where there's an index pin. There, there, on the bottom, and then on the top. It's all that I'm aware of. So you have to kind of bring it apart at roughly the same time. So those don't jam up. Okay. Those are good looking gaskets. I cannot argue with the quality of the look. But that is definitely oil that is seeped down, which means it's had to still be leaking right there. So that is, I mean, let's be real, that's kind of a design flaw. So here's the fuel tank half. That oil tank ends right there, and you've got a screw here and a screw there. And there is no screw anywhere here, and there's no support going across here to clamp that. That's kind of shitty. That's definitely a design flaw. So anyway, now that we've identified that, my goal is going to be to clean this all out and yeah, reseal it like I talked about. See if I can get this plate off. Because that's got to come. You know what? The oil almost had to be... Well, I'm not going to judge yet. Let's get this off and we'll see what the heck we see. One, two, three, four. Yeah, four index pins. And that doesn't look distorted much. It's more distorted down here than anything. cut these gaskets did a damn fine job. I'm pretty impressed. I know if it had been me it wouldn't look this nice. Alright, what do we got? Alright, there's a layer of sealant across this and it was broken right there. I think that's where it was leaking. I think right here there was a break in the sealant, and that was just letting the oil slowly bleh, right on down in. Which is unfortunate. That really is. Alright, so the way I'm going to proceed, again, I'm going to clean all this up. I'm going to razor blade all this old sealant off. I'm going to hose this out good. Really good. And then what I'm going to do clean everything with acetone, that'll pull the water out, pull any remaining oil, especially off of the gasket surface, but I want the whole thing clean. So I think I will, I'll seal this back up using the modal seal, no gaskets, just this plate, and let's check our clearance. Yeah, got to be a good seal with sealer because when you push hard right there, there's a tiny smidgen of a hair of a gap there. Now, I don't want to start beating on this. That's not going to do anything other than distort the whole thing and make it worse. I'll just put a very healthy bead of the moto seal across here as the tank is assembled. And again, once it's dry, both tanks can get lined with red coat. And that should take care of it. Okay, everything's clean, dry. Wash it out with good degreaser, hot water. Let it sit in the sun for about the last four hours. Give the kids a chance to have a play date with the neighbors. So now I'm using the moto seal. And I'm doing the plate on the side that goes onto the index pins first, because that'll make it less of a pain in the ass. 
Normally I'm pretty careful with this stuff. I don't want a super thick layer and I'm not going crazy with it, but I want a good, good layer. We don't want any leaks, we don't want any surprises. When we get it back together this time, we want it to be the last. Ooh. And here's the first goober on my finger. It's great. Again, just getting a good smear. Yes, I'm going right over the bolt holes. And I made sure to get an extra, extra good amount right there at that division for the, <clears throat> the oil and fuel tanks. So that was clearly where it was leaking previously. Down we go. All right. That could have been messier. Okay. So when I just put finger tension on there, you can see, I hope, sealant coming out all along there. That's critical. That's going to be equally critical we get it on the top side too. So for this one, make sure my hands are clean enough, I don't mar up the finish, we'll do the part itself. Now again, if you're going to have any spill out, you want it to be to the inside of the tank, in this case, if at all possible. You'll get some visible sealer when we tighten it down that's just it is what it is but this stuff as tempting as it is to try and clean it up when it's wet is better left alone because then when it's dry what's left becomes a kind of a, a limber rubbery type substance and you can go along with a razor blade and trim it off and it really doesn't look bad real goal is to get it sealed and I'm confident that this is going to do it and then uh, and the whole point of prepping it so well with the acetone and drying it out was so that we can red coat it after the fact between the two this thing is not going to leak the reality is the red coat shouldn't be necessary but we're going to look at that as an insurance policy this sealer will seal fuel tanks but the longer it goes without having fuel directly in contact with it. To my way of thinking, the longer it's going to last. Maybe flawed logic, but it's served me well so far. Okay. Nice even layer on everything. And I forgot there won't be any there, so that is the only spot. Right there. So the screw to hold that the screw right there is what's going to make that seal and I see a good even layer across there we should be set put that out of the way we'll set this in place try to line up those index pins without too much goofiness least amount of bumbling around possible. <laughs> There's still a little bit of water in that pinhole. Could have done without that, but didn't do anything to the sealer. Alright. There we go. Now the way I did that, you'll see, especially these inside holes, you can see that there's sealer coming up through there. That's good. We want that. We want that to come around the threads. I've individually cleaned these screws up as well so they don't have any grease and sawdust and other unmentionable nastiness on them. Alright, that's a long one. That's a long one, which 
means that's a short one. And that's a short one. So while this is setting up, I don't want to. I don't want to tighten these all the way. I just want to get them snug, and then I'll torque them. Let's this stuff set up a little bit in a way that allows you to build almost a gasket that you end up compressing. And again, I found that that is desirable. It works well. So I'm just getting down to where I start to see a little bit push out. Not much. But at this point, if there was a void anywhere, that would be something we'd want to address. So again, that's that's what you're looking for. This is now going to sit and dry overnight. And when I come back to it next, this will all be dry enough. I can take a razor blade along here and just kind of kind of peel it away what's visible. It doesn't look terrible, but we'll clean it up a little bit. And then uh, we'll put some red coat in it. Okay, so it's a week later. Uh, got some work done kind of during the week. Uh, let this boot sit without being pushed into the wrong shape and it's actually flattened out and gone back to shape pretty much the way it should. This one edge, this one ear way out here that just a slight tear has nothing to do with sealing to the carb or sealing down to the engine. So rather than waste 15 bucks on a boot to replace one that's otherwise brand new. This is new rubber. I mean, look, that's pliable. That, there's nothing wrong with it. So, I'm confident this is still fine. Some other parts I was confident were not going to work the way they were. Uh, the isolators especially. I'll go through this tank in a second. So, you've got a rubber isolator. you got an insert there. And then you've got this threaded insert that was supposed to be attached here. So this one, it's just the threaded insert that's loose, but you can't tighten it properly. You can't loosen it properly. It's not going to give the same level of anti-vibration control because it can sit there and slip in and out of the threads. That one, <laughs> completely sheared. And it was loose in its threads. So, of the five, three are 100% shot. This one, and the other one on the throttle handle, appear to be fine. Now I take that back. Look at that, that one's coming. But look, that one's not broken all the way. I can rig this. I can use some adhesive to keep this one going. These parts don't grow on trees, and they aren't cheap, so I like to reuse where it makes sense, but not where it's going to be an imminent failure. This one is completely solid. No tears, no cracks. I don't hear the, the rubber crinkling when I do that, so we're good there. But a number of those, again, they came out in that steel insert was left down in the down in the threads. Now thankfully none of them were corroded into place. Look at that door. Otherwise this would have been a whole lot less fun. But anyway, the bad ones, got some new ones here ready to rock and roll. The tank, we left off with it all torn apart. It's all back together. There was nothing magical. We saw and remember, yeah, I just put the Permatex Moto Seal on the baffle and we had lightly screwed it together. Since then, I finished these screws off 
and lined both tanks with the red coat. Probably can't see it. You might see a little maroon coloration in the cap threads. It's there. Now, I thought I could explain all of it by that wrinkled boot. Maybe not all of it. Someone had replaced the fuel hoses and all the hoses at some point with Tigon and some of them were close to okay well they were still okay but that's one thing about Tigon it holds its shape once you've had a filter in it or something like that you have to pull the hoses out of the tank to do the red coat you can't reuse them but one of these oil pickup filters was what was being used as the fuel filter now that's not okay one of the purposes of a, a fuel filter, whether it be a felt type like this, which is an OEM style, or one of the kind of ceramic, I think it's a ceramic based cartridge. You know, it's, it's hard. It sucks fuel in and acts like a sponge. So in a way, it's almost a little mini sump, so that you always have an adequate amount of fuel being supplied. When the engine's at wide open throttle and generating a lot of pulse, the carburetor is probably not going to have any trouble pulling fuel. If you idle for a little bit and you've got a little rinky dink, like this is the other, this was one of the oil filters that was being used, but A, the orifices there are really small. I mean, it would flow enough, but there's no sump action. There's nothing there to hold it. So when it was getting hot, or when the engine would warm up, that's when it was cutting out, apparently. And that would make perfect sense, because that's when it's going to require the most fuel, when it is hot. It's going to need a steady stream, and if you have any variation on that, not going to work. So, with all of that being said, let's go ahead and get our fuel tank back into place. We'll put some new isolators on the tank here. And I think this is the working end. I think we're going to put the three new isolators here. And the one that we, we re-adhere this ring to will go on the other side of the throttle handle. I think that'll make the most sense. So there's not anything special, just Line it up so that the threads actually start, so it doesn't feel like they're galling. And that's all I do. Give it a good twist. You wouldn't want to do that with pliers or something, because you could run the risk, in theory, of damaging this rubber mount. Now, these have got to be pretty stout to put up with what they put up with, but as you saw by that other one, they can break, and they will. Now, that one was probably years and years of use, but that's beside the point. There's no reason for us to do anything stupid that's going to speed it along. All right, so we've got our isolators back in. I had already replaced this pulse hose. I did that off camera, but two screws, this whole plate comes right out. Yeah, that's going to be wonderful. That's my work. We'll see what kind of fun message they leave. Uh, anyway, this comes right off. And with the boot still attached, the intake adapter is going to come right off the engine. So you access the little port, hose, boom, no problem. But one thing we want to make sure we don't forget before we put that tank on is we've got to get that little oil line. This is the manual oiler discharge line back into place. tank is going to cover this up and we will not be able to access it. Okay. Doesn't need to be crazy. And then you just start slipping it into place. Now especially with these new mounts, I'm pushing. There we 
ago. And actually, it wasn't as bad as it could be. Sometimes you kind of got to work and shimmy and shake and use a couple screwdrivers to push those mounts in as you slide them into place. For whatever reason today, they decided to play nice. Now, one thing I noticed taking this damn thing apart was all of the screws, all the sizes were mixed up. It was just a little bit of a disaster. So I decided I'd bring the manual out and I'm going to look at what screw size belongs in there. And we're going to go at it that way. And then any that are just oddball out of place are going to get replaced. So 51, the isolator mount screw. 8805-1, a 3 quarter, 1024 by 3 quarter. would be that. And unless, let's see. That, that's definitely not it. That's interesting. Okay, there's a proper one. And there's a proper one. I'm pretty certain, folks, that I'm going to be digging through the screw bins and going to the new bin if I have to. The screws that are used on these, like from the 350 all the way up to the 750, are a later style. They've got the washer already on them, they got a screwdriver slot, and they got a 5 16 head. I knew that wouldn't be lined up perfectly, but that wasn't bad. This is going to feel so much more controlled the next time it is used. Just having the right, or at least good shape mounts in there. Come on, baby. Interesting. That's the right size, but it's acting kind of boogerish. And I don't like that. So either that screw's got a problem. The threads and that new mount aren't as happy as they should be, so we're gonna try a different three-quarter inch screw first. Hold it through one of the steel notches here. No. Not okay. Well, that's fun. You know, I love that nothing can ever go quite smoothly. So, what I'm going to do is take this back out. I can't see anything obvious wrong in there. But I'm going to make sure it's not bottoming out. If it is, then the IPL honestly is calling for the wrong length of screw and if it isn't no it's bottoming out that's funny I'll just drop a couple sizes but my wife just got home which means lunch is here and that is more important okay we'll do it right this time the longer screws are appropriate where the flange the metal is thicker over on the drive case side, the metal is not as thick, and therefore it calls for a half inch of threads as opposed to three quarters of an inch. So, you got to be careful. That one 
That one caught me because I didn't look further up in the diagram to the different uh, location. Now the lower one here might be full flange thickness. In fact, 51 it is. So it's real easy to get this stuff mixed up, even if you're used to working on these. And if they come out mixed up, then you really have some fun. Yeah, see this screw, let's see, this screw right here is recessed in there, this has a full thickness flange, so the longer one is appropriate for it. in place. Pretty straightforward. Um, notice I left all these hoses just kind of willy-nilly. I wanted to make sure that I had enough length once the carburetor's in there to bolt them back up and it's a lot easier to just leave them hanging out of the tank like that as opposed to fishing them back out down the road. This guy, this is that one with a partially loose mount. I'm just going to clean it up a little bit. Make sure there's no oil and nasty in here that we can avoid. Some of you guys might be scratching your heads right now going, uh, that ain't gonna work. <laughs> Actually it does. This isn't my first time doing this. I've done this on some of my own saws. Like I say, it doesn't pay to replace parts that don't need to be replaced. At all. So we're going to get some glue back in here, the underside, and that was a pretty healthy amount. And as I'm going along, what I'm going to avoid is getting any anywhere in the threads, especially when it comes time for reassembly. Even though super glue might be the ultimate Loctite, that seems just like a problem waiting to happen. Okay. Again, some of the original bonding agent was still working through about half of this. So that's why I am comfortable doing exactly what we just did. Okay. Piece of cake. Now I'm just going to lightly thread that in. It's a good hot day here in southern Oregon, so this glue is going to set up pretty quickly. And by good and hot, it's 1 o'clock, well, 1 1.30, somewhere in there. A nice healthy 93 degrees already so this garage is going to turn into an oven before too terribly long all right time to change our angle 
It's also a good time for me to put the cap back on the acetone. All right, let's see if I can get some better. There we go. That's not bad. You guys can see a little more of what's cooking here. So there, that's where that's still just slightly distorted, but it will seal. I am utterly confident of that because it's going to snap into this recess right here. And then once the carburetor goes down, it's going to push it flat and seal down into that relief. So it'll work. It'll be good. So the tank is in place. We're going to fish some hoses through. Got your pulse hose. Comes up from the bottom. Not going to go too far yet because I don't want to get ahead of myself. This is your fuel hose. I should have left an angle cut on that. I don't know why I didn't. I always do. Except for when I don't, apparently. But fortunately, that grommet is working with me. So there we got there. Alright. Oh, stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Stupid. This hose is our automatic oiler pickup hose. And there is a barb just right there that has to hook to. You can always tell the saws that I work on a lot and then the ones that I don't. ones that I don't are the ones that I make silly little mistakes like this on. It's going to slip down here. We're going to go like that. Pardon my head, but I can't see the barb. I want the automatic oiler to work. I want everything to work. There we go. That's got a route under there. That seems... Yeah, hit the... Just hit the bottom of the tank. Loving it. Loving it. That one's still a little bit long, but it's not in place yet. Here's our manual oiler pickup hose, and that I am going to cut a little angle on. I'm going to fight this thing. That may have not been too little of an angle cut. Okay. All right. That's enough to start working this bad boy into place. Now we do need to get some lock nuts out and reload for these four screws here. And that's probably best done right now. Push them back all the way in. They can only go in. Well, they can go on the floor. They can only go in one way. You got to get them. You see, these castings are designed to hold them and keep them from spinning. So you got to get them flat, and then you can just push them right back in. Same thing on this side. This side's nice and easy to get to relatively speaking. You 
one of the few home lights that uses this style of attachment. McCulloch got a lot of their saws, even back in the 50s, had nuts that slipped out like that. Which was great. Made replacing something damaged a lot easier. You didn't have to worry about a stripped out casting, but you did. have to worry about losing them. Okay, now that slipped into place awfully nice and easily. And now we need to work. Now I didn't take the back up and through. And just like Johnny Cash saying, we're going to do it one piece at a time. Only it's going to be in one piece when we get done. Starting to pop up. Make sure I got no garbage on the pliers there. Garbage in an engine's bad. We all know that. Just getting little bits of this up here. Look at that. Just like so. So as long as when I set the carb down, I make sure the screw pushes just over like that. Voila! You can actually see the old ceiling areas here. And they're all intact. And that boot has dropped right into those recesses I was talking about. So, this couldn't have gone any better. Let's see what size screw is supposed to secure that. Number 31. 1024 by 5 eighths. I was going to take a wild guess and say that would be four of those. And that would be correct. Get them all started here out earlier doing my shipping drop-offs, UPS, post office and all that, and I decided I needed to go by my trusty buddies at Harbor Freight. Seemed like I had lost all of my smaller blade screwdrivers, whether it be up on the firewood hill or one that I just misplaced today. Decided, hey, you know what, for three bucks, what can it hurt? Yeah, they're going to be a piece of crap. It ain't gonna last a whole long time, but again, it's three bucks. Back when craftsmen guaranteed their screwdrivers forever, it was a different story. I would have made the time to go to Sears, but I really don't have that option anymore. All right, let's go ahead and lock. Well, do we want to? Do we want to lock this into place just yet? It's not. Let's put in our AV mount screws first. Let's get this so uh, it's semi-reasonable. Yeah, let's mount those up. So, number... 51. 88051, 10.24 by 3 quarter. Okay, that's not the same size, that is, there we go, and this actually, this side feels like it, it had been jacked up for a while. screw had kind of cut a few threads in that housing from bouncing around so much. But that won't be an issue with these new mounts. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. No, 
well that solidified that up. This cracked area over here that's been repaired is not not the best thing ever, but say it is solidified. Alright, there's a loose fit on that oil hose. So now this one we need to get a bunch more out of the tank. I knew there was too much. We'll form a bending arc as we connect that so that there's no pinch points anywhere. There we go. Perfect. Once that connects, that was a slip right over. So I can get my big hand. There we go. Beautiful. So this thing's coming along quite nicely. Still gotta remember. I'm gonna get a screw in that top muffler mount. All right, I think it's time to go through the carburetor. Even though it was a runner, sorta. Of, I can't in good conscience not at least take a, excuse me, a peek in there. So I'll do that. As long as everything's good, we'll come back and uh, wrap up the assembly. Okay. So, once again, trusting my instincts was correct. There is another reason that it wouldn't run right when it was hot. That is the fuel inlet screen. The entire screen just came out. That is what the gasoline and oil mix had to get through. It's a mix of felt, sawdust, oil, and God knows what else. Other than that, this carb looks fine. But that screen right there was severely limiting. Severely limiting how much fuel could get through to the engine. So, I am now confident, honestly, between the slight wrinkle in the boot the failure to have a proper fuel filter acting as a sump and that restriction, this thing is going to run fine. One more thing I want to point out before I button this carb up. This is an SDC, what? 54B. So this must be a 450. It is. Couldn't remember, honestly. This has only one adjustment, a low speed needle. The high speed is fixed. So instead of being drilled and having a Welch plug like normal, you see it's got a little jet screwed in there, and that's a .028. So that's how those fixed jets work. The fuel's in here. When you transition to the high-speed circuit, it draws fuel through that fixed orifice. And it's going to be too rich every single time. Not extraordinarily so, but enough that you can't burn it up. That was the whole purpose of a fixed high-speed jet, so that's how they achieved that. So, we'll put this thing back together as soon as I can find a new screen, and we're not going to bumble around on camera for that. Okay, back together, new screen. Not forgetting anything I can think of. All right, let's see if we can get this all monkeyed back together. This linkage is somewhat difficult to work with. Yeah. That might be a, an insult to linkages that are actually difficult to work with. This is just a pain in the ass. Stop is in the way, you son of a bitch. Come on. I never thought that unlike what design, something that was harder to put up linkage properly on than super easy. The way they succeed on this thing. Alright. Oh, Save that slip. Okay. And this is why I didn't hook this up all the way. It's a pain to get started once the carburetor's in place, but it's a pain to get everything else started when it's in place. So, you know, kind of. Pick your poison, I suppose. I need to cut the angle edge off of that. That would have been easier to do without carb in there. 
but it works, whatever. You get out of the way. So it's important you don't mix them up. The pulse is on the back side here. Get that slid all the way up the barb. So you can avoid having any wrinkles. Slide into the lower grommet hole there. Mm, looks pretty good. Fuel hose comes in right up here, and then we also want to avoid kinking that, so we'll pull some more out of the tank if we have to. Don't know that we'll need to. Get this in place and we'll see. Good. Nice sweeping turn. Nothing kinked. We might be doing all right here. Okay. There we go. Now I'm going to see if I can get this thing. Oh, still got the old grommet gobbledygook on this bracket. I'm going to scrape that off. No reason for that to be there. Get the vast majority of it. The razor blade. rest the wire wheel can take care of. This is where it's important to not do what was done before. A new boot that hadn't ever been abused that would be slightly easier but not a whole lot and that's why that thing ended up the way it was so now we're gonna get the other side going which again that's that's what it should be right there so before I get too far along I need to get this high low grommet back in which will be infinitely harder now that there's a screw in it, but there's not too much in it. And if it gets to be too much of a pain, I will take that low speed screw completely out of the carburetor. Set the grommet and put the screw back in. But it appears it's not going to be necessary. There's one spot right there that needs to pop on through. So close, folks. Got it. Done. Very nice. And you can see that carb sat down quite a bit. That's what that phenolic fibrous spacer is for down there. Let's the carb pull that boot down to a certain point. 
seals to the car, but you can't go so far that you jack something up. Now it does look like there's a little bit of kinking going on in the pulse line here. So what I'm going to do is rotate that fitting just a little bit. Ouch. There we go. Nice. Nice 90 degree. Perfect. Now the only thing that's left Oh, that's stupid. <laughs> Choke rod. I think it's jammed here. Ah, dang it. Oh, folks, I, you know, to say that I've had it with some of this would be an understatement. My goodness. Spring fit. Once it goes in, it's gonna be in. But I don't want to pull the damn. There. Oh, for goodness sake. All good. We hope. All right. So we're going to hook that oil line up now. Yeah, see, lining this up. There it goes. I think I have decided it's easier to have that thing loose than not when you're putting the carb in. I've gone both ways with it over the years, and I think I finally decided. That's a pretty big barb on this manual oiler, but if you slowly work it, whether you use a Tigon or home light hose, doesn't matter, it'll stretch. Just be careful. Remember this is the suction side, so it's not, not under critical. Oh yeah, a little remnant of oil in there. Just saw it discharge from the plunger through the line. I could hear a little suction in the tank. Fuel hose is hooked up. We might as well drop that bad boy in. All right. Still getting a little off gassing out of that red coat. That's typically the sign when it's ready to go, when you don't smell what smells like fresh red coat. Now, it was pretty hot the night that I. I did this, and it's been sitting for about two days, which should be more than enough. It really should. The only thing I didn't do is run a fan at it like uh, like they say you can. So I think maybe I will stop there. I don't want to risk damaging that, even though I think the the Moto Seal did this, the trick. We went to the trouble of doing the liner. Why screw it up? I think I'll let it sit one more day, and I'm going to set this thing right in front of the little fan I got here on the floor. Because it's already getting hot enough that uh, this garage is getting uncomfortable, to say the least. And my kids are bugging me for a damn play date. So, I now have the option of continuing to sweat my butt off here in the garage, or going and drinking a beer and visiting with my neighbors. I think I know which one I'm going to choose. So we'll come back when we can do a test run on it. 
Okay. I still won't be able to do a, a test run just yet, but that's only because it is too early. It is just a few minutes after 7. I got out to the shop nice and early this morning. Try and beat the heat a little bit. So I slipped the nuts back into their retainers from the sides here. You basically have got to come in with your needle nose pliers. And it helps to have a screwdriver from the top kind of pull them into place. So let's put the throttle handle brace on. I think I've got all these screws separated out by size here. This one, the nut is captured in by the, the throttle handle grip, but getting it lined up can sometimes be fun. Like right now, it is resisting. And... Damn it. Had been in place. It's off to the side here. Maybe I can catch that. toughest parts about working on some of these saws, especially if you've got multiple sizes that are real close together. If you're taking apart a saw that you're really not familiar with, it's best to label and put each batch in a little baggie. It sounds kind of dumb, but it does work. Great example. Wonderful. Wrong size. Those are too long. That should have never been in there. The way that I know that. Oop. There we got a lock nut that fell out. I know they shouldn't have been in there, so I could see them hitting the housing there. And this is going to be... There we go. Okay. Since those are lock nuts, you don't have to compress this tube any more than it already is. It's 
possible that I made a mistake in judgment and these actually go up top here which appears like it might be the case See that upper one I wonder if I stripped yeah These are just plain too long for anything. Don't belong there. So, I'm going to have to find a... The 550 IPL I've been looking at doesn't have this early 450 handle style in there, so I'm going to have to find the right size for those. But, we can put the starter housing on here. Hmm. Eh, it looks like a bad spot in the rope. It'd be a hell of a shame to go to all the effort we're going to and not replace that. And I know how this goes. First or second crank, you think you got it fired and the rope comes zinging out. And I just don't think I'm in the mood to do that today. So there's a number of ways you can tackle these starters. We'll try doing this the lazy man's way. And I don't mean that in a bad way. What I mean is we'll avoid dinking with the recoil spring. So you see how this is open right here. Technically, we can pull this rope all the way out. Spring's going to be under a lot of tension. Tie a knot in our new rope, slip it through and let it wind itself back up. Now this pulley doesn't have a notch in it to put the rope in and pre-tension, which is kind of annoying. I might put them in there for the most part, but you don't have to. Because the other way to handle this is to just put your rope in and then tension it from out here. I forgot the 450 has that as well. Yeah, you can tension it, but you can't remove the pulley, so the starter post is on the back side of this cover. That's what it's screwed to right here. So if you had your grip in place, you could tension it that way. But I'm going to show you this trick, pretending we couldn't do that, because it'll work for other saws. So most of these starter ropes are... Uh, what's my tape measure? 46 inches long on these bigger saws. And that accounts for what you need for your knots. And all of that. And I usually leave a couple inches extra just because rather fill that rope to or fill the pulley to capacity with rope than not and I always burn the ends on the spool where I just cut it and then rope itself because I don't see how this is already starting to unravel it's actually worse than normal A lot of ways you can tackle this. I know some guys use a oh a heated wire to cut the rope. There's a lot of different ways. That works. Just let it cool a little bit before you roll it with your fingers. You won't burn yourself much. Or at all if you do it right. Okay, so if you didn't have this nice fancy pull the three screw and tension it option, what you're gonna do feed your rope back out just pull it out 
Now that's a lot less rope. No, no, I take that back. It's not a lot less, but it's about eight inches shorter. So we're gonna have to give this another uh, another wrap. What I'm gonna do is tie a little half hitch here. Pre-tie a knot in this rope. You don't want to leave too much of a tail. You want enough that it's not going to pull through, but you also don't want that tail hanging down and catching the starter pole studs. Because then your new rope is a pile of trash after it's wound itself around those studs and ripped the handle right off. Don't ask me how I know that. Alright. So we got the new rope ready. Let's pull the old rope out. Now I'm just holding this with my thumb. It's not that much effort. But if for some reason you were having trouble with it, you could always put a pair of vice grips on here and have a handle that's got a little more leverage. So I'm gonna go, excuse me, for another wrap. It feels pretty going no to. I don't like a handle that lays over. I want it to be tied up against the starter housing. And now I'm just going to feed this through. You can see it's coming through. Okay. Press the knot down into here. Alright. That looks pretty reasonable. That shouldn't pull through. Give us time to tie this off. Now you could let the rope wind in holding it to make sure that it had enough tension on it and then pull it back out and tie the handle on uh, with two extra wraps there. I'm more than more than certain that it's going to be fine. And if it's not, I will pull those three screws out and just give that cover a twist. Okay. Pulls itself up tight. Perfect. On principle, we're going to lubricate that. There's a nylon bushing down in there. You don't need a whole lot. Work it in. And here we go. really important, especially on these vibration isolated saws, that places like the starter don't end up getting bolts that are too long. Especially right here, go over and start rattling against your oil tank and punch a hole in it. This lower one would punch a hole in the bottom of the fuel tank. And I have seen that happen. Yeah. You say it's still too early to do a test run on this, but I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, we'll come back in an hour or so. All right, here we go. This will be a cold start. Realizing one thing I never did look at was this funky on-off switch. That's funny. It must be an aftermarket one. Because it goes... 
the wrong direction for the indicator plate so it's definitely aftermarket I might have something laying around but let's see if this thing will run because that's what I really want to know and it's a lot of compression just assumed because of the information I had that there wasn't a spark issue. It's now as good a time as any to find out. doesn't give us a little pump bang off of that. There's still more work to do on this dang saw. Okay. Spark is good. It's taking a while to prime it for some reason. much compression is fun to crank over on a bench where you don't have good leverage. All right. Now, I thought I'd already replaced this duckbill valve. Ha, no. Yeah, no, sir, I have not. <laughs> so that's a classic example of something that goes wrong with these saws. good deed goes unpunished. Anyway, most of your leaks from a fuel cap are going to be that valve. And that one was certainly shot. I just need to get the red coat out of the threads right here so that it'll pull the, the gasket down tight. So anyway, there we go. That concludes the 550. This is going to get the, the typical treatment of sitting for a couple of days. Plus, i got to locate an air filter. I don't know if I have any in stock or not. I may have to order that. Uh, 
but yeah it sounds good you guys could hear it reaching up when it was when I go to full rev it would get pretty rich and it would start to clean up but only so much you get a bar on this put it in some wood it'll be just fine that's the way these uh, single or fixed high-speed jet carbs are like they uh, on the bench especially if it has a governor my goodness it's gonna sound kinda like crap when you rev it up to full throttle because that governor's kicking in and the only thing it knows is it doesn't want you to burn up the saw and it's tuned for a cut so when you're free revving and there's no load it's gonna run richer than a, than a son of a gun so anyhow like I say I'll get an air filter get this dried out after one more test run and uh, it'll be heading home